Okay. I hope it's all back started now. Okay, so here's, uh, I want to go th begin with this li code listing for Zoog. And um, so I have a block of code here. Block of code, as I said, is sort of defined by having curly brackets. And this particular block of code is called void setup. And void is a term we use uh, when we're setting up what's called a, a method or a, a subroutine, if you like, in the software. And, and it, it doesn't produce any output. It just is doing, what I mean by output, doesn't produce any output to the screen. It's just executing something internally that's used by other pieces of code. So void setup, so it's not producing any output, but what it is doing, it is setting the size of the window. Okay, so here it sets the size. So you can either see size set, uh, being set without using this void setup, or in this case, I put it inside void setup. Now, void setup is a block of code that's executed once when we start the program. Now, there's something else called void, called draw, which we will use all the time in processing. And the code, block of code and void draw. This is a block of code that's run over and over and over and over again. And you'll get a better idea of what that means uh, as, we, as we go along in the course. But this runs once, this runs, and then when it's finished, gets to the end, comes back and it runs again, gets to the end and then runs again. So void draw keeps executing over and over again. Void setup executes once. We only have to set the size of our graphics window once. So uh, if I run this, you'll just see the Zoog program. There's output, here's Zoog, my good friend. And um, so uh, it, it looks the same as in the last class. And one of the things that maybe you're picking up on here is that uh, when you're writing a piece of code to accomplish a task, there typically there's no one right answer. Usually there are multiple ways to, to accomplish the same result when writing a piece of computer code. And um, so um, this is now a similar but different program that does Zoog. Uh, previously, we didn't use void setup and void draw. So here I'm doing Zoog with void setup and void draw. Most of the time when you run a processing program, you will have a void setup and a void draw loop. And the void draw allows you to do graphics that change with time because uh, if we run through void draw and then change a parameter value before we run through again, and then change a parameter value before we run through again, we make the execution dynamic. In other words, it can change with time. That gives us a graphic that moves or a graphic that changes color or, or uh, executes a, a sound file or, or not. So the whole idea of void draw allows us to have dynamic code, which is why this is called Zoog is a dynamic sketch. Okay, so that's uh, what this whole block of code was intended to do. It's basically the same Zoog program we had at the end of last class, but now written using void setup and void draw. Okay, so let me close that. Okay, now, Let's uh, do a second example here. Okay, now let's uh, let me show you first what this does. I'll run the program, and then we'll go through the uh, the steps. Okay, now so I have a a box, and notice that inside the box 
I've drawn a square and the square follows the mouse. OK, that's pretty cool. OK, follows the mouse. Wherever the mouse is located, the square follows. OK, now. So. It's not a long piece of code. And the, the fact that the piece of code is dynamic, in other words, it's changing as it executes, is because of void draw. So void setup runs once, sets up the size of the box here. Void draw, okay. Let me make this now. Let me just reiterate. These are comment statements with a double slash. There's another way to do comments, uh, which I'll mention uh, in a little while, I think. Um, so try moving background to setup as that they're saying, uh, uh, moving this to setup and see the difference. So this is setting the background of the graphics box. And we reset the background to white every time through draw here. So if I don't reset the background every time through draw, what happens? So let's move it. Let me comment it out here. I comment it with a double slash. And then I'll take that and copy up here and put it up here. So this runs once at the beginning of the program. Now it doesn't run again because I commented it out. Now let me run this. OK, it looks the same at the start. Now, look at that. What happens is it's not resetting the background to white every time through draw. So it keeps the old rectangles because it's not resetting the background to white. So putting background in void setup executes once at the beginning, but not again. Now we could leave it there and take it out here like that, run, looks the same, and essentially the program appears as it originally was. But I don't need it here. OK, so why? Because it's reset, it's re-executed every time through void draw. OK, now this is setting up, um, I calling it body. A stroke zero is the color of the boundary of the rectangle is black. It's filling the rectangle with a gray level of 175. It's using rect mode center. Now, what is rect mode here? How is this? How is this center and everything working? That's a that's a question. Rect mode center. What does that mean? Now we have um, mouse X is a keyword that the sketch replaces with the horizontal position of the mouse. Mouse Y is a keyword that the sketch replaces with the vertical position of the mouse. So mouse X and mouse Y. What this is doing is it's now changing the center of the rectangle to wherever the coordinates of the mouse are. So the rectangle uh, still has the same size as determined by these two, but now we're locating the center of the mouse. Here, mouse X, mouse Y, we're locating the center of the mouse at the coordinates of the mouse. Let me just show you this again. So here, notice wherever the mouse is, that's where the center of the rectangle is. Now, 
suppose I took out rect mode center, so it defaulted to the way the rectangle program automatically starts. And remember with that, the, the default execution of the rectangle function, let me comment this out, is these two coordinates specify the upper left-hand corner of the rectangle. Let's see if that's what happens. I run, there it is, and here's, notice that now the mouse position is in the upper left-hand corner of the rectangle. So that's pointing rect mode center makes the center of the rectangle then the position of the mouse rather than the upper left-hand corner. So let me take that out, comment out. There we go. So here we go. So that gives you some idea what's going on there. Now, um, we could um, change, for example, suppose instead of the center being the position of the mouse, I make the center be the position of the mouse plus, here, let me make it plus 20, plus 20. So I'm changing the X position of the mouse. So the center is now the position of the mouse plus 20 in Y. Look at that. The center of the rectangle is offset from the position of the mouse, and presumably the offset is 20. Okay, that's um, not too complicated. Uh, and uh, I'm just giving, I'm actually giving an example of several software features. I'm showing you how you use this dynamic draw prompt function that runs over and over again to make a graphic that changes. Um, the graphic is I'm just drawing a square and I'm making that square follow the position of the mouse. Okay, so I, I actually think that's you know, pretty cool. Okay, now let me go to my next example. Now, example three, three. Here we go. Okay, we're back to Zug. Zug as a dynamic sketch with variation. Void setup, sets the size of the window. Void draw, first thing we do is set the background of the rectangle to be white of, of the box, the drawing box to be white. Um, we set our ellipses and rectangles to center mode, so they each have a center mode here. Draw Zug's body, stroke zero is setting the boundary of, of shapes that we draw to black, stroke zero. Um, this is setting up an ellipse with a fill on the ellipse is white. The center of the ellipse is related to the position of the mouse in the X direction and position of the mouse minus 30 in the Y direction. Okay, and we're drawing eyes and legs. Notice the eyes and legs their positions don't depend on the position of the mouse. Only Zug's head here depends on the position of the mouse. The legs don't depend on the position of the mouse. So here we're moving part of Zug, but not everything about Zug. Now let me run this. Okay, there's Zug's, he's got his eyes and his legs, I guess. Now I bring this in. And here's his head and body. So there. So you see only part of Zug here as determined by 
this, which is Zug's body, which depends on the position of the mouse, and the head, which also depends on the position of the mouse, but is offset. I mean, let's look at that again. So you see the, the rectangle, the top center of the rectangle. You can't see it because it's partially covered by his head. But the top center position of the rectangle is determined by the position of the mouse. And the Y position of the head is offset by negative 30 um, from the, or offset by 30 here. So the Y position of the head is offset. The X position of the head is not offset. Same thing for the X position and Y position of the body here, right here. So as you can see, we uh, we are um, um, again using the dynamic properties of draw and making a graphic which changes with time. In this case, the change is a simple one just related to the position of the mouse. Okay, let me close that. Okay. Okay, this is also using draw in a simple way. And I'm going to draw a line where you can think of the position of the mouse as uh, enabling us to draw this line. So let's look at this here. Um, set up the graphic window right here. Now we're doing something. We're adding a, an element to the draw program. The draw program is really straightforward. Uh, we're drawing, we now have a stroke, a line, a boundary of, of a box. If we draw a box, is going to be black. And we're drawing a line, what a line is. The line is drawing a line. And what line does, this is the current position of the mouse, mouse X and mouse Y. This is the position of the mouse on the previous run through with draw. Now think of draw as executing over and over again. Draw runs, and we have a position of the mouse on that run here. Then it runs again. Now, if we move the mouse, we'll have a new position of the mouse, but we have the previous position of the mouse, which is now accessed by P mouse X and P mouse Y. So P mouse X and P mouse Y represents the position of the mouse on the prior run through draw. So imagine draw is just executing over and over and over again. And uh, so mouse X, mouse Y is the position of the mouse on the current run through draw and P mouse and P mouse X, P mouse Y, the previous run through draw. And we're drawing a line and the line goes from the previous position of the mouse to the new position of the mouse. That's what's happening here. Let's see this, let's run it. Here's our box. Now, bring mouse in. Now, the position of the line begins at zero, zero, which is the upper left-hand corner of the box. Now, as I move the mouse, I'm drawing a line that follows the mouse. So I'm drawing little straight lines. You can probably see that here. I'm drawing little straight lines, and the lines go on the previous center of the position of the mouse to the current center of the mouse. So that's what these lines are. It's not, it's not a complicated thing, um, and um, I'm just drawing lines dynamically 
to with the draw function. OK. Now I think I'm at three five. OK, I'm going to do something where when I press the mouse, something changes. OK, let's let me run it first because I don't remember what this does here. Let me run it first. So here's my box. OK, and nothing's happening, right? I'm moving the mouse around and nothing happening. But I press and I get a rectangle. Now I, I release the mouse press. I press again, I get another rectangle. Press again, get another rectangle. So this program draws, actually it draws little squares every time I press the mouse. So let's go through that piece of code and see how it works. Okay, here we're setting up the size. Notice background is right here in void setup. And that's important. I'll move it to void draw in a minute, and so you can see. Now, void draw executes over and over and over and over and over again. But nothing happens in this example. There's no piece of code here. OK, now here's void mouse pressed. So this is another block of code, and I'm calling this block of code mouse pressed. So void draw is what executes over and over again. Mouse pressed, OK, void mouse pressed it is not inside void draw. So this doesn't execute over and over and over again like void draw does. Now what does void mouse press does? It sets the boundary of our rectangle to be a, a black line, fills the rectangle with gray, sets the center mode, sets the rectangle to center mode, and then it draws a rectangle at mouse X, mouse Y. And the rectangle is 16 by 16, I think. So now here's something I haven't. Whenever a user presses a key, the code written inside key pressed is executed. A key pressed just sets the background to 255. So it looks like pressing a key resets the background to white. So if I'm reading my code properly, here, Every time I press a mouse, I'm drawing a rectangle. Whenever user clicks the mouse, the code written inside mouse press is executed. Void mouse press. That's what this means. This is mouse pressed, okay, right here. It means that whenever I press the mouse, this piece of code is executed. Void key pressed. Whenever I press the key, press any key, this piece of code is executed. OK, now, so let's see now again. I haven't pressed the key yet. Let me run the code. Here it is. Now I'll press the mouse. There's my box. Now I'll press any key. It erases the box. So there, three squares, press a key. They all get erased. Why? Because whenever I press the key, it runs background. OK, that's so you see how we can erase what's been going on inside the graphics box. OK, in this way, we just re-execute background and it redraws, in this case, white 255 over everything in the graphics box. OK. Now, let me, I'm running out of pieces of code here. I think I got two more examples. OK, 3, 6. Interactive Zoog. 
So this is going back and drawing Zug. So we set the size of the window. Now, I said void draw runs over and over and over again. When we set frame rate, we're setting how many times a second void draw executes. So this is setting frame rate to be 30 times a second void draw executes. Okay, beginning void draw, we set the background to white. Um, set ellipses and rectangles to center mode. I think we could have done that in void setup if we wanted. When I'm, I could do an experiment and change that, see if it changes anything. Draw Zug's body. Okay, so here's Zug's body. Here's Zug's head. Notice that depends on the position of the mouse, as does Zug's body. Draw Zug's eyes. Again, depending on the position of the mouse. Notice that wherever these all change relative to the position of the mouse. He has two eyes. They're slightly different positions. Draw Zug's legs here. And then, then we have void mouse press. The prince, take me to your leader. Okay. So let's let's run this and see what happens. Looks like this is a there we go. Okay, run. And now, boom. So Zug now follows the position of the mouse. Notice something here. Over here, Zug's eyes are black. And then as I move to the right. His legs, his legs are moving. Yeah, and his eyes are changing color. So here we have to change the color of the eyes. And as you pointed out, his legs are moving. They're kind of dragging behind. So let's look at the code again here. What's going on? So notice when we're drawing the legs, we use that P mouse X and P mouse Y. So we're drawing lines between the current position of the mouse and the previous position of the mouse for the, each of the two legs. That's what makes his legs appear to drag behind like that. Now, when I, let, me, let me do the mouse press. So notice I press the mouse and down here, I get, take me to your leader. Okay, I think I saw that movie. Now let's, uh, Let's see here. OK. Are we changing the color of his eyes? The eye color is determined by the mouse location. That's what it says here in this comment statement. And that happens by fill. Here's fill. Now remember, we have red, green, and blue. Now I understand the red. The red is determined by the position of the mouse divided by two. Green is, there's no green. And then we have blue here determined by the position of the mouse divided by two, but I'm only seeing red, so I'm a little bit uncertain as to what's going on with that. I see the red. Now, suppose I make this zero. Let me change this. I said, if you're not quite sure, you see a piece of code, change things to see what happens. So, ah, here's what it is. Look, I just figured it out. This is mouse X and this is mouse Y. So what happens here? If I go down, the color changes. Now here, the color changes. The eyes change to 
blue. Here they change to red. Here they change to blue. And then this is red and blue, which is kind of a purple. So that's what's going on here. OK, figure that out. Um, so, um, so this one, we set the frame, here we go, we set the frame rate to be 30, so we can change how frequently the draw execution, the draw program runs a second. Um, and we're causing several components of the graphic to change over time with the position of the mouse, and we're adding a statement that that prints out here, take me to your leader when I press the mouse. OK. So there are a lot of things going on in that program. Uh, we're kind of pulling together everything I've talked about in the previous examples. And, um, and you're starting to get enough here, I think, where you can go in and start playing around with this. And um, and you know try doing some different things. So for example, what would what would we do if we wanted to make the eyes go to green instead of red? Although you know red is a is a little bit more dramatic. So here notice it's blue over here, turning to red as I move to the right. Okay, so okay. OK, one last thing I want to mention here before I, I finish class. Is I want to talk about these modes. You know, there's an ellipse mode, rectangle mode, where we change the mode of the rectangle. Let me close this. Let me come back. I think that's what I this is supposed to. OK, here we go. Yep. OK, look. So here we are. So I'm using different versions of rect mode. I have four different versions here, but this is commented. This is another way of doing comments that I promised I was going to show you. Okay, we could I could put a, a, a double slash in front of every line to comment every line, or I can put a slash asterisk and then down here, I put an asterisk slash. And everything between these two is a comment. So this is a way of commenting an entire block of code. OK, so these are different drawing modes. Corner, corners, radius, center. Um, now this is all commented out. So um, let's just look at what happens. It looks like I'm drawing two rectangles. Here's a rectangle. It's filled with white. 25, 25, 50, 50. Well, what rect corner does is it changes what these numbers mean. So when we change the mode, we're changing what these numbers mean. Corners, what is that? Uh, does that mean anything? Trying to remember corners. I don't remember doing that. OK, here we have. OK, should have made this bigger. OK, here's my graphics program. 2525 sets the upper left hand corner. So that's what's going on there. So this is the default mode. When we draw a rectangle, the first two numbers set the upper left hand corner. This and this set the width and the height of the rectangle. So this is the white rectangle. Here's the gray rectangle, fill 100. OK, 25, 25, 50, 50. Um, now it looks like, um, so what's going on here? This looks like this. But it's a little bit different. Draw a rectangle using corners mode. <coughs> Excuse me. We could change some of these numbers. We could make this. Let's make this. 10. So we're going to be drawing 
not a square, but a rectangle, I execute. So notice now, this is moving around a little bit. Okay, so these two numbers aren't exactly giving me the height and the width of the rectangle here. So what is corners? Now, we could do this two ways, figure this out. One way is to play around with this, changing these numbers and see what happens. And the other, as I've told you before, is to go into uh, Professor Google. So here I've already done it. This is if I do processing rect mode, it'll, it brings me right, it gives me a link right to this page. So here it describes what these different rect modes do. So all I've done here in this piece of code is, is basically copy these things right here. So I'm, I'm telling you here, so corners, rect mode corners, interprets the first two parameters of rect as the location of one corner, and the third and fourth parameters as the location of the opposite corner. So what this is doing, if I read that right, is the first two are the coordinates of the this corner. The second two numbers, 50-50, are the location of this corner. Now that makes sense. Let me change this to 100-100, or let's do 100 Not a thousand, a hundred fifty and run. So indeed, that's the first corner, second corner, a hundred fifty. So that's what corners is doing. Now I could uncomment these two things and let me comment these two. Notice, by the way, on this particular section of code, I don't have void setup or void draw, and I'm not setting the size of the box. So the size of the box goes to default. Now, let me do slash asterisk, asterisk, slash. So now the whole program is commented out. I run, nothing happens except I'd, I'd get the default box. Now let me take these two out. So now it's doing rect mode radius and rect mode center, drawing two rectangles here. So I run and now I get this. Okay, so, um, I am going to leave these last two statements uh, to you to look at that box I was just showing you. Do Google Google processing rect mode, and uh, and then you will see it was where we were where I was just looking. It describes how these two things work. And I'll leave that to you because um, I got started way late today, and it's not shouldn't be uh, too confusing here and how this works. Okay, so, uh, yeah, well, like I said, what I'm doing in class is not identical to my pre-recorded videos. And the homeworks are basically dependent on the pre-recorded videos. But this is giving you some, uh, a little bit of extra information, a little bit different, I think, a lot of this stuff will be covered in the pre-recorded videos. Just I'm doing it a little bit out of order here and trying to give you some uh, additional information that if you wanted to try to draw some graphics now, you know how to do a fair amount. You know how to draw ellipses, circles, straight lines, rectangles, squares, um, and you can draw other shapes too. We haven't gotten to everything. Uh, you, you can make certain shapes follow the position of the mouse. You can change 
the color uh, as uh, dynamically. There are a lot of things you can do now that if you're interested, you can start to play with and do interesting graphics. And if you go back and, and uh, you look at the, uh, the bomb program, let me just go back and look at that here. I showed you at the beginning of the second half of the course. Um, oh, I don't want, oh, damn. Um, it's um, not running the program because, uh, like I said, it just installed a software update. So it put in a new version of Java, which uh, in the old bomb program requires an older version of Java to run. So that's really annoying. Um, now, let's, uh, I could install an old version of Java to run the bomb program. Yeah, I. I tell you, this computer stuff drives me crazy. OK, um, all right, what I was going to point out to you is you had, when we had all these moving elements in the bomb program, we had the airplane moving across the screen. We had the, uh, the leaflets fluttering down to the ground. All of that was done using the draw program that executed over and over and over again. So we were able to uh, to make it work uh, using the draw program. OK, now let's. Um, um, let me. Here, come back, get out of screen sharing mode. There we go. OK. Hey, everybody. Um, so um, any uh, any uh, questions, comments, um, uh, insights uh, about um, where we are and what we've done so far with processing? Uh, the election. Well, I tell you, the election. The, uh, the election uh, was pretty exciting for me, actually. And the reason was uh, in the United States, people can go to the to the polling location and they can vote in person. In each precinct, it's like each neighborhood has its own polling location and uh, or they can vote by mail in advance, which is what I did. I voted weeks ahead of time. And um, uh, and each state in the United States does their um, uh, does the way they count the votes. They they do it individually. Some states do the voting in person at the polling location. They count those votes first, then they go back and mail in votes or some states flip that around. Most states do the in-person polling location votes first. And, and um, it turns out that most of the people who voted for Trump were people who voted in person. And most of the people who voted in Biden voted by mail. Why is that? Well, if you, unless you've been dead, I think you realize I'm not a big fan of Trump. And um, part of the reason for that is that uh, unbelievable that in this day, there are people that are skeptical of science. I think Trump probably believes that the earth is still flat. And um, so Trump didn't was trying to downplay the coronavirus. 
arguing that it wasn't real, it was fake and all that. And the Democrats were saying, look, the coronavirus is real, it's dangerous. If you can help it, you don't want to show up in person where you might can't want to catch the virus, vote in mail and don't put yourself at risk. So the Democrats were telling their other Democrats to vote by mail. Donald Trump was saying, show up in person and vote by vote in person. So in the states then that counted the in-person votes first, they were mostly Trump votes. So as the states started counting the votes and they kept accumulating the total of who was voting for which candidate, Trump was getting a lot more votes than Biden. So it looked like Trump was winning almost everywhere. Then after they counted the in-person votes, they switched to counting the mail-in votes, which were mostly for Biden. So it looked then like Trump was falling behind and Biden was catching up. And um, so on Tuesday, last Tuesday, a week ago, exactly a week ago from today, um, at the end of the day in the evening, they're counting the votes. It was looking like it was going to be a blowout for Trump. And I just couldn't, I couldn't believe that that's what was happening. And I went to bed very depressed. When I got up on, on Wednesday morning, they had started counting the mail-in votes for Biden. So Biden was beginning to surge ahead or at least catch up. And um, which was, of course, uh, made me feel a lot better. So I went to bed Tuesday depressed, woke up feeling better. And then as they continued to count the mail-in votes, it was pretty clear that after a while that Biden was going to win. Of course, what Trump is doing since almost everything out of his mouth is a lie. Um, what Trump was saying, oh, why am I mysteriously now beginning to lose? The pro-Biden people must be throwing in fake votes so that Biden catches up and beats me, which wasn't what was happening. And even in the states controlled by Trump's party, they were saying, that's not what's happening. We're just counting the mail-in votes. So Trump is using this now to argue that somehow the voting isn't legitimate, which is actually, I think, pretty sad. Uh, it's the sign of uh, what I would view as uh, the kind of excuses that losers make. Losers make excuses. And this is where Trump is right now. So at some point he will, uh, he will either accept the election or if he doesn't accept the election, what will happen is that noon on January the 20th is when the presidency is supposed to change hands. So Joe Biden becomes president noon and on January 20th. And um, the Secret Service, which is the uh, sort of like the security group of men and women who are designated to protect the president, the Secret Service, when they when they take their vows, they they don't take a vow to protect the president. They take a vow to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution says that noon on January 20th, Joe Biden is president. So what will happen is the Secret Service will, will then escort Trump out of the White House so that Joe Biden can move in. That's, I really do expect that to happen. Um, and uh, But I think Trump will concede because he will begin to realize that he looks like even more of an idiot than he does now if he doesn't concede. He certainly doesn't want to have images 
of him being escorted out of the White House by the Secret Service. So, yeah, this these past several days here in the United States have been pretty exciting because uh, we have, uh, you know, we have Donald Trump in the office, which is, uh, I consider that to be a huge embarrassment for the United States. Trump got elected because he wasn't a politician and people wanted someone who wasn't a politician in to be president. They just, I don't think, completely realized what a clown he is. Um, I, I've said many times I think he is mentally ill, and I think that becomes clear with every hour of every day. So it's been pretty exciting for me. Uh, I've never experienced a presidential election like this. And, you know, I'm, as I tell people, I'm an old man. Uh, I'm about uh, one third as old as the country is. And, uh, and nothing like this has ever happened before. We've had close elections before. I remember way back, you may have heard of one of our presidents years ago, John Kennedy. I remember the, I remember when John Kennedy was elected, I think I was about 12. And um, that was really a close election. But I mean, nothing like this. I mean, it's unbelievable from my perspective. So I'm sorry about coming in late. Uh, like I said, the computer surprised me. It was in the middle of installing a software update. And um, so with that, um, I think uh, I'm done for today. So I'll see you guys in, in two days. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Nice day. Uh, okay. Gallagher, I wanted to ask. Yeah, well, go ahead. Can you send the Mauro's uh, the project? I wanted to look at the codes. Um, if it's possible. Yeah, the, uh, um, the the bomb one. Yes, the bomb. Yeah, it's really I'll, interesting how she did that. Yeah, I will send it to you. Mm -hmm, um, thank you. And uh, she did it. I mean, I I worked with her on it, so uh -huh. she didn't do it all by herself. You know, we, we we worked on it together and there were new things when we were doing it that I didn't understand either. So we worked on it together and we, you know, learned what we needed to do as we needed to do it. Unfortunately, that's typically the way I do all of my computer programming. I'm learning new things as I need them. So, yeah, I will send out the, the bomb code. Uh, but uh, and uh, so I hope it runs for you. It's it's not running now with my latest software update. So um, okay then. Um, uh, I will. Uh, I'll do that. And um, and you guys take care of yourself over the next few days. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.